Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I can see Rebecca's face. So will you nod and let me know if you can see my screen? Oh, now you're gone. Just kidding. I hope you all can see my screen. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. So I will be talking about rotational grazing techniques for uh, small acreages today. A little bit about myself. So I grew up in southern Idaho um, in a town called Cuna. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a smaller town, but we're growing rapidly. I grew up on a five-acre farm. Uh, we raised cattle, sheep, goats, and this year we had our first litter of pigs. Um, we've lived there my entire life, and um, we actually do have a large uh, cattle operation of 100 cow-calf pairs, um, but we do not have them on our five acres, so I want to make that clear. Do you, it's hard to make that work. That's not enough space for them. Um, we do rotational grazing with our cattle, um, just how we have it set up. It doesn't work um, super great with our sheep on how our breeding schedules are for the two. And then I recently married into a family, um, and we, with that, I am now part of a large farming operation of 400 acres of cropland, um, where we grow alfalfa, mint, and corn. And this year we're going to put some beans in, so we do get supplemental feed um, from that as well. All right, so what is rotational grazing? Um, you might have also seen it called management intensive grazing. So it's the practice of moving livestock from one pasture to another on a regular basis. Um, and this isn't a one size fits all. So keep that in mind through this whole presentation. Um, I do have notes on my side that I'm reading off of, but all of this information is available to you guys. Um, so don't feel like you need to be scurrying writing notes down. So what this does, rotational grazing does, is it increases the amount of feed. Um, and the way we do this is we evaluate the forage quality and quantity that is in a pasture um, to determine if it is ready to be grazed and for how long. So what does rotational grazing do for us? It can extend the grazing season. So um, quite a few places you can actually graze the entire year through the winter, which seems crazy. A lot of people um, feed because there's snow on the ground, um, but there is ways if you have good um, pasture stands to um, rotational graze throughout the entire um, winter season. Um, it does give you stronger pasture stands. So if you do rotate, you know, up through fall, that next spring you should have a better um, pasture stand that comes back in um, than you did before rotational grazing. By rotational grazing, you have more uniform grazing. Um, you've probably driven by those pastures that um, there's just like these little weird tufts of grass randomly and everything else is grazed all the way to the ground. Um, so by rotational grazing, you shouldn't see that. It should be this perfect luscious green, um, all the same level set of grass, kind of like the picture on the right. It's a little blurry, but um, you don't see any ground. You don't see any dead plants or anything. You will get a higher quality um, forage. The plants will be healthier, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, you'll have less weeds. The reason for this is um, the healthy plants are able to push out those bad weeds that you don't want. So if you have healthy grass, um, you shouldn't have those weeds coming and taking over. And you can make hay with extra ground. So um, I married into my husband's family, and we my husband and I were using some of the land um, that is ours to rotational graze our cows um, for a couple of years. And last year we were actually were able to um, take some of that land that we were originally rotational grazing and uh, turn it into hay ground. So we have a couple um, grass hay fields and extra alfalfa fields because um, our other pastures are doing so well. Um, so we were able to take that extra and um, create extra money income by selling some hay and extra feed to have on hand. So um, additional advantages, like I said, you should have increased um, forage production and I'll show you some pictures on 
um, why that is. Um, you should have increased for soil fertility. So those plants um, are healthier, so they're putting more things back into the soil to help the soil do better. And then you're also having animals that are more evenly distributing their feces um, throughout the pasture as well. Um, you should have less, less waste. So I talked about those pastures with those weird tufts of grass everywhere. Um, so the reason those are left is because they're not as palatable, palatable um, for your livestock to eat. So they leave them and go find um, smaller, younger plants to eat. Um, so with a more even grazing, they should leave, um, it should be, uh, what am I trying to say? Less waste, that's what I'm going for. Um, it does extend your grazing season. And again, healthy plants push out the plants that you don't want like weeds. And it improves your animal management. So um, a lot of times, so we move our cattle uh, once a week usually. Um, some places do it once a day. Um, some could be once a month. Um, but we're, before we rotational grazed, you know, we went and moved cows once during the year. Um, and now since we're moving them every single week, uh, the cattle are used to us. They have been trained to do a certain thing and it's a lot easier to manage them. And that's not even just moving them from pasture to pasture. Uh, they're a lot easier to um, bring in and doctor even. Um, and when we brand calves, it's a lot smoother process because they're used to that in-person contact and they know how we want them to work with us. So rotational grazing, like I said at the beginning, there is not a one size fits all. Um, the number one extension answer, when I started my job two years ago, they told me it was okay to say it all depends. And that's very true for rotational grazing. I can't give you a map and say you have five cows, here's your map, this is what you need to do, and it's gonna work perfectly. It's gonna take time to figure out what is best for your operation, for your livestock, and for the ground that you're using. Um, there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, so climate is one of them. You um, might be in a higher altitude area, so it's cooler seasons. Um, uh, seasons, you might have uh, extra rain one year, so you have really good plants, or you might be in a drought year and your grass isn't doing really well, especially if you don't have irrigation. Uh, the number of paddocks is going to uh, vary. So on our property, we actually have, um, they're all about one to four acre um, lots or paddocks. So we can keep cattle there for, um, you know, the whole week where some people might have much smaller paddocks. And so they're only there for the day. So depending on how your property is set up, how many times you want to move them around, um, your paddocks will be different sizes and how many you have. And then the forage type and quality and quantity, um, that'll change um, how your process works um, over how mine works. And then if you want to use supplemental feed. So because we um, graze cattle and sheep, we take everything off in the winter um, just to give everything a break, um, just because sheep and cattle eat different things. So we have different plants that are doing different things at different times of the year with them grazing. So we take them off and we supplemental feed through the winter. Um, there is a trade-off though. It's going to be a lot of work to get this set up um, for anyone. It was a lot of work and we've been doing it for probably four years now and it's still not perfect. Every year we're um, changing our management style, changing everything to make it better the next year. Um, but with this work, um, you get better parasite control because you're constantly moving the livestock. Um, so the pests that usually um, bother your livestock might not have hatched by the time your animals have left that paddock. And then by the time they get back, they're already dead. And so your animals have less parasites. And then you're going to have better pastures as well. You don't have those little spiky things poking up and eating all the way to the ground. So animal grazing habits, um, it's different for every species. So uh, most of our paddocks are set up for cattle and then we have a couple that we use um, for sheep when our cattle aren't there, our sheep are there. Um, but the thing to keep in mind, so they graze differently as well as eat different things. So our cattle think some plants are more palatable than others um, and then our sheep like other things um, 
as well. So keep in mind, if you are going to have multiple species, they are all going to be a little differently. And that means you might have to move them quicker. The cattle you might move once a week. Um, pigs, you might have to move every day so they're not rooting the ground. If you're gonna do um, some type of poultry, you're gonna wanna move them often as well because they will um, tear everything up and out and eat it all. Um, so everything's going to be a little different. So if you do have multiple species, um, there's that extra proponent of making sure that you are um, working with all of them and how they eat. <clears throat> so the different types of grazing, so the one we're talking about today, rotational grazing. So it does require um, more management, but you should have more forage by doing it this way. And then there's continuous grazing, which um, is very common. That's what we were doing before rotational grazing, where you put livestock out and they just eat the pasture all year long. And when it's gone, it's gone. Um, you don't take them off unless you're irrigating, um, which is super easy. But um, a lot of times you have to supplement a lot more feed that way. So here I want to talk about um, how you have those better plants. So you're thinking, I'm going to rotational graze. Is it really going to make my plants that healthier? Um, and research is showing that they do. So the grass on the left, um, it was, we could say, 12 inches high, and they ate six inches down. And look how much better those roots are in the ground. Where the one on the right, maybe I left my sheep out all year long um, and didn't rotational graze, and that's how little those roots are. So you can imagine that next spring when I put livestock back out there, the one on the left is going to be doing a lot better just because um, it has um, better root growth and the leaves on top are able to um, supplement other things to help that plant grow like um, sunshine for photosynthesis. So here's a, a graph talking about if you're rotational grazing or continuous. So on the left side, that would be short-term grazing, so maybe you're moving them every day or every other day. The middle one might be every other week, every month, and then the one on the right would be continuous grazing. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, this is just another graph showing um, that the top does reflect um, the bottom. So plant roots are directly related to what you see above. So if your plants are grazed all the way to the ground, you can imagine that if you put a mirror there, there's not a lot going on underneath. So by letting those plants um, recoup longer and have more left um, when you leave the pasture, they're going to do a lot better. <coughs> So grass does need uh, nitrogen applications. So this can be done um, in several different ways. So you could um, apply fertilizer, um, nitrogen fertilizer, or you can plant legumes that are uh, nitrogen fixing um, to put nitrogen back into the soil. Um, so those are legumes that can be clovers or alfalfa. Um, there's lots in the area that are popular. Um, but keep in mind, um, the more um, legumes like alfalfa that you have, the more likely your livestock are to bloat. Um, so that's part of keeping sure that they're rotating often. We actually only keep 15% um, um, legumes in our pastures just um, because it's a worry of our cows bloating and we don't want to deal with that. So um, that's up to you. That is an extra cost though because we're not willing to put more than 15% legumes, then we do have to apply um, nitrogen fertilizer. So quality versus yield. So <clears throat> if you see in the middle where the pink and blue line um, cross, that is like the perfect scenario. That's where you want to be. Um, livestock do not um, like flowering and seeding plants. Um, they're not as palatable to them. They like the younger plants. Um, so on the left side, those two um, have been grazed recently. The one in the middle, um, so if you had 10 paddocks, um, you started with number one, now you're moving back to number one after going through 10, two through 10, and that should be what it looks like. It should be 
um, a healthy younger plant before it flowers and seeds. Because once it goes into that flowering seeding stage, um, livestock are less likely to eat it because it is less palatable to them. So stocking rates, there um, is an equation to figure out how many animals you can put um, on in a certain size acreage um, or paddock. So um, animal units is what is used in this equation. So on the right hand side, there's the um, table on how you determine um, what the animal unit is for the livestock that you're raising. Um, I am not going to lie, math is not my strong suit, hence why I'm not doing an example today. <laughs> um, but there are tons of videos on YouTube um, and I'm glad to help one-on-one -on -one with this, um, but it does take me a little time to make sure I have all my numbers lining up correctly. Um, so if you do need help figuring out how many livestock you can put on certain size um, units, um, please let an extension educator near you or myself know, um, or check out the videos online. <clears throat> So we have a couple of definitions um, that are important. So carrying capacity is stocking rate at which animals perform, performance goals can be achieved while maintaining the integrity of the resource base. So how much feed is actually in your, pro, in your pasture? And then stocking rate is how much feed um, you're going to take. So those two things should equal each other because if you put more livestock than there's actually feed that you want to take, then you're going to have um, pastures that don't look great when you leave them. So you want those to be equal. So stock density um, increases you, the uniformity of grazing um, because animals are competing to get the best plants. So normally if you have continuous grazing, they kind of do their own thing. They go through the pasture and they look for the plants they want to eat. Um, it's like a little kid at a buffet. If you go to Golden Corral, they're going to go to the dessert section. Um, they're not going to eat the less desirable foods um, that are available. So by giving them a smaller selection in less time, so in terms of the Golden Corral situation, I might tell my five-year-old, all right, you have five minutes and limit how much food they can have or limit the space they're allowed to go in. And they're gonna be less selective um, and just grab the first things that look good. They're not gonna go around looking for the best thing that they want. So you're gonna have less selectivity. So you, you shouldn't have plants that are left um, higher than others because they should evenly eat all of them. You're gonna have better manure distribution because um, normally, livestock will um, move in a certain way. So our cows in the morning go out and they start in the front of the pasture and they slowly move and by the end of the day they're in the back of the pasture. Um, if you are doing um, intensive grazing, they're going to spread out quick and fast and eat as much as they can. They're not going to think about their day and where the sun's at. They, they want to get as much food as possible. So the number of livestock um, should increase with pasture size. So the larger the pasture, the more livestock you have. And the smaller the pasture, the less likely, the less livestock you should have. <coughs> or um, you do it this way. If you're going to have few livestock um, on a larger piece of property, then they're going to be there for longer. Whereas if you have... Um, more livestock on that same size, they're going to be there less time. So on the left side, we have one sheep. So he's going to be on the one acre for 100 days because it's going to take him time to eat all that food. Whereas if we take that same acre of land and we put 100 sheep on it, they only need to be there for one day because they're going to evenly go across that one acre and eat it down um, evenly and then be moved to the next one. So how do you decide how you're going to set up um, your paddocks? So um, this might be something that you already have set up to a certain extent. So um, like I was talking about earlier, our properties are all one to four acre size um, pastures. 
So we didn't put any additional fencing in. All we do is move livestock from one pasture to the next. Um, but you might have 10 acres and you want to split them up. So on the left side, you can see those are not square and that's totally fine. They don't have to be perfect. Um, there's no perfect scenario. It's not a one size fits all. And um, the important thing to keep in mind though is no matter where you put them, they need to be able to access water. Um, so as you can see, all of those pastures on the left hand side go into a corral with the tank and they can open and close the gates based on which pasture they're in. In the middle one, <coughs> you have um, six perfectly square uh, paddocks and then an alleyway that goes down to the um, stock tank for the water. And then on the right hand side, um, they're all just one after another. Um, this, this scenario um, is a lot harder for water though because a lot of times if we, this is like a 10 acre spread, um, you're gonna have to move a trough every day. Um, or every week just to keep that water where it needs to be. And keep in mind, hoses are not as long as they should be. I s swear they're always six foot too short. Um, so keep in mind, how are you going to get water to those places um, before you put fence up? So you need to have a sacrificial area. So I talked about how we take all of our livestock off our rotational pastures um, in the winter and we supplement feed. Um, so this is where we bring them is into our corrals, um, our sacrificial area. And there's other reasons you need this too, even if you're going to rotational graze through um, the winter. It protects your pastures. So um, normally you should take your livestock off when you're irrigating um, just to prevent um, muddy spots, damage to the plants, um, messing up your corrugates. So this area can be a place that you bring them um, when you irrigate. Um, like us, we have multiple pastures in different locations, so we can rotational graze while irrigating. Um, they go off of one pasture and we start irrigating the one they just came off of. Um, but some people, um, your irrigation may be set up that you have to water all of them at the same time if they're all in one location. So you need to take the livestock off um, and put them in that sacrificial areas. <clears throat> Uh, this is an area that is heavily used. You're not planning on anything to grow there. Um, if it does, that's awesome, but don't think that it needs to be luscious and green like everything else. <clears throat> Other reasons, um, if you irrigate and um, it's still wet when it's time to bring livestock back onto there. We don't want to compact the soil because it's wet. So you might bring them into the sacrificial area for an extra day and feed them a supplemental feed just to um, keep the ground healthy. All right, pasture poultry. So these are super fun. I get lots of questions about them um, and they're they're fairly easy to do. Um, they're great to follow other livestock. So Rebecca talked about um, all the different species of livestock you could have um, and poultry are great to follow any of them. Um, so you wouldn't have poultry in uh, a paddock with like cattle or sheep, um, but after you remove cattle from a paddock, then you would put chickens out there. Um, so on here, it just shows the recommended size um, because you do want to keep them confined or else they will spread out to the other pastures. Um, reasons that this is great, uh, it does help with feed savings of the chickens. Um, they don't eat a ton to start with, um, but this is a supplemental thing. Um, and it also is a great nutritional source. So. Um, they're going to pick up things out there that they're not going to be fed in that um, grain finisher that you might be feeding them. And they also eat the bugs. Rebecca was talking about how um, chickens will pick up uh, parasites that might um, affect your other livestock. So by putting them in there afterwards, um, you might have worms in your feces and the chickens should eat those up and take care of that problem. <coughs> so, um, some of this applies to all livestock, not just pasture poultry. So the first one, time of day, um, they're most active in the morning and evening. That is for poultry. 
Um, a lot of times in the heat of summer, you'll notice that as well with uh, larger livestock species as well. Um, when it's super hot in the middle of the day, they'll find a shady place to lay. Um, but pasture poultry um, are more active morning and night. So you might need to get up early to put them out in the pasture and maybe bring them in at night. Um, that, that's up to you. Experience, it takes time to adapt. And this is true for all livestock. Um, you might figure out a plan and be all ready to rotational graze and it is bulletproof and then your cows say no way man i want to eat the pasture over there because i guarantee it's greener even though they look identical um so it's going to take time to train your cattle uh, or your livestock um, just in general they're not going to know what you want from them um but once they learn that if they stay in that smaller pen and eat as much as they can, you're going to move them to a prettier pasture the next day. And, and they will willingly go. It will be easy to move them, um, but they will take some training. <clears throat> Shade is always um, good to have for all livestock species, but especially chickens. Um, with better pastures, though, they should be cooler because that grass um, is cooling. Uh, forage, you want to follow the um, chickens with livestock after they have grazed it. You don't want to put the chickens out there with a plant that's 12 feet tall. Um, they're going to get lost and they're not going to be able to utilize that area as well um, and they're more likely to dig um, because they, they want stuff under the ground because they can't reach the grass at the top. <clears throat> fencing. Let me look at my time here. Okay. I'll speed up a little bit. Um, so fencing, make sure that your outside fence, the one that goes um, around your entire property, is a permanent fence. Um, the reason for that is we do want to keep other people's livestock out, but we do want to keep ours in. Um, especially when you're first training them, um, like I said, that cow might be like, no, I don't really want to be in this pasture. Like, I really like being that one over there. So just in case they do get out before you have them trained, excuse me, you want to have that perimeter fence that is permanent um, to help keep them in in case they do get out of the smaller paddocks. Um, so you do want to have um, good fencing. You can hire people to put in or you can go to a local fencing um, supplier and buy the stuff to do it, um, but make sure it is, is properly put in and uh, suitable for the livestock you are raising. Um, if you're doing multiple species, you might have to um, put the two fencing thing. So a like cattle, you can have single wires, but sheep, you might want to have um, netted fencing on the bottom. So you might have wires on the top for the cattle and then the netting on the bottom so the sheep don't walk through. So a couple options um, when you're doing your inside fences for your paddocks is you can have permanent fences um, inside. So if you remember the picture of like the perfectly square paddocks, those can all be permanent fencing, um, but you don't have to. You can um, do portable fences um, or temporary fences. So you might even just do a single wire on all of those. Um, Portable fences are great because you can move them as you move the livestock. <clears throat> Again, um, the fencing inside of your permanent fence can be permanent. Um, it doesn't have to be. It can be um, temporary where you move with the livestock or it could be semi-permanent where you do put a T-post in the ground and it stays there, but it's only a single wire and can be taken down easily to bring equipment in if you are going to hay it or whatnot. Um, so this is just a graph. I'm not going to go into details um, about how um, fences for each livestock species should be. Um, so keep in mind, um, this is going to be an experiment. It's not going to be perfect. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You can't do what your neighbor does because um, your livestock are going to be different. Your grass is going to grow differently. So remember, growth is a process of trial and error, uh, experimentation. So Benjamin Franklin said this. Um, don't be upset that the first year you try it, 
Um, you know, rotational grazing goes good the first three months and then it just takes a downhill slide. Um, it's going to take a couple years. Like, like I said, we've been doing this for uh, four years and we change things every single year um, to increase um, our yields and have better pastures. So are there any questions for me? Let me see. You do have a question about how can you get more grass into a pasture that seems to have more junk than grass? They tried seeding a small patch and wild turkeys ate all the seed. All right, so um, the first thing I would say is you might need to get um, some fencing to keep um, wildlife out. Um, that would probably be the first thing. Oh, my questions are jumping around. Um, and then the second thing is, so if you put in pasture, um, sometimes it costs a lot to reseed um, by actually planting seeds. So I recommend letting the grass grow up to the seeding stage. So don't graze it. Let that grass reproduce its own seed and try and fix those areas on their own. Um, I don't know what you mean by junk. I'm going to assume weeds um, and not trash. Um, but if you get good grass coming in, they should eventually um, weed them out. If you have patches that are really weedy, you might need to address those um, differently um, by pulling or spraying those areas. And sometimes uh, fertilizer will really help that grass get more competitive. Um, you've got a bunch of questions here. If grass has gone to seed, should it be mowed or should we put goats and sheep on it, which we have? <clears throat> I would put livestock on it first because when you mow it, um, the stuff that comes off is just going to die. Um, see what they'll eat um, because feed does cost money, so put them on, on out there first and if they're really picky about it um, then go ahead and mow it but um, pick up what you mow don't just leave it on the ground pick it up like how um so like if you're doing it with a lawnmower i would do a pull behind sweeper uh-huh because all you're doing especially if it's really tall is you're covering up the the grass that's going to want to grow and then the sun's not going to get to it. Uh-huh. Okay, another question from Butte County and maybe you are going to address that in the list you talked about, yes. but what, what should be plant in our waterless pasture? Are you going to do that later? I'm going to do the list. I'll just type it up so that people okay. don't have to scramble while I'm <laughs> getting them off. Okay, and um, let's see. I think we have a break in scheduled in two minutes so let's try this question what is an effective or reasonable approach to manure management for stalled animals horses that is and pasture management um, are manure spreaders effective specifically can manure and bedding be spread directly from stalls to pasture or is there a composting step needed um, would this approach be seasonal I live in western Washington, much rain and occasionally snow, mid-October through mid-May. So uh, you can um, clean out uh, manure and bedding and directly put it from the stalls to the pasture, um, but it's not going to be um, readily available for the plants to use because it needs to be broken down. So if you have the means and um, a place to compost, I would suggest doing that. Um, and there are tons of resources on composting. Um, I would be happy to um, look up some of them and add them into the chat box for you to use. Okay, well, it is 1019 and uh, we have a 10 minute break scheduled for right now. So we do have more questions, but we can talk more at, um, in, after our next presentation. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was so helpful. Thanks. I'll put up our resuming at 1030 slide. Kate, if you wouldn't mind.